for the record, and we'll now recognize our, our, our panel. Mr. John F. Sopko is the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. He was appointed by President Bush or President Obama, pardon me, and uh, was uh, uh, confirmed July 2, 2012. He spent more than 20 years on Capitol Hill, he was including uh, Chief Counsel for Oversight and Investigations for the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, chaired by Representative John Dingell. It's a distinguished career, and I appreciate, uh, sir, your taking on this uh, most difficult uh, assignment. I know you're supported by a, a staff that's uh, patriotic and committed to, to uh, the, the betterment of this country. It's a difficult situation, to say the least, but we appreciate you and your staff and those that have joined you here today and those back at the, at the office and certainly in Afghanistan for the great work that they do, and I appreciate you being here. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Mr. Sopko, we would like to turn some time over to you for an opening statement. We will be followed by questions from members uh, here on the, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, and the other members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss U.S. efforts to help the Afghan National Army procure, deliver, and account for fuel, which includes petroleum, oil, and lubricants provided to its forces. For fiscal years 2007 to 2012, U.S. funding for Afghan Army fuel totaled almost $1.1 billion. Because fuel is a valuable commodity that is vulnerable to theft and because helping the Afghan Army develop a supportable and sustainable logistics capability is an essential part of transferring security responsibilities to the Afghan Army, SIGAR initiated an audit of efforts by the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, or commonly referred to as CSTICA, to develop the Afghan Army's capability to supply fuel to its forces. Based on our ongoing audit work, we have serious concerns about this program and see Sticka's method for estimating fuel needs on which to base funding requests. We are also concerned that C. Sticka has incomplete records of fuel purchased for, delivered to, and consumed by the Afghan Army. In fact, C. Sticka was unable to provide us records on nearly $475 million in fuel payments because, according to C-STICA officials, those records had been shredded. Let me explain a bit about how the fuel ordering and delivery process is generally designed to work, as shown in this first chart with fuel procurement and distribution. And I believe that you do have an electronic record of that chart. In that chart, you will see that Afghan Army units at the bottom are supposed to submit a fuel request to the Fuel Depot, uh, which is a request number 14 uh, that we discuss in our, uh, uh, my longer statement. The depot is supposed to fill that order and, when needed, request fuel through the Afghan Logistics Command to maintain its supply. The Afghan Logistics Command approves the depot's request and is supposed to submit it to C. Sticker. See, STICA is then supposed to review the order and submit it to one of four fuel contractors to deliver to the designated Afghan Army location. Once the fuel is delivered, the Afghan Army unit completes a receiving report showing the amount and quality of fuel received and submits that form to both the Logistics Command and C. STICA. C. STICA then will use this form along with the original fuel order and delivery ticket and other supporting records provided by the fuel delivery contractor to approve payment. That is what is supposed to happen. C. Sticka's ability to accurately protect itself from fraud and theft, as well as to develop Afghan fuel logistics capability, depends on the effective implementation of these required processes to validate the accuracy of data related to fuel orders, receipts, payments, and ultimately overall Afghan Army fuel requirements. Unfortunately, SIGAR's auditors have found that the process I just described is seriously broken, and C. STICA does not know the actual fuel 
funding levels needed to meet Afghan Army mission requirements. As you can see in the second chart, see Sticka's current method for estimating the amount of fuel the Afghan Army needs does not include basic information that any household here in the United States or a small business would want, such as how many vehicles are there that require fuel? That would be an obvious question to ask. How many generators are there that require fuel? How much fuel does each generator require? How many Afghan Army fuel storage locations are there? How much fuel can be stored at each location? And ultimately, how much fuel has been consumed at each of the Afghan Army locations? We are also concerned that our audit found that there is no single office in the United States Army, Defense Department, or to the Afghan Ministry of Defense that has complete records on Army fuel ordered, purchased, delivered, or consumed. Moreover, as mentioned by the Chairman in his opening, C. Sticka, we found that C. Sticka did not have any records of fuel purchase and payment information prior to March of 2011 because they had been mysteriously shredded. For the time period that they claimed they had records, which is March 2011 to March 2012, C. Sticka could not provide more than half of the documents we requested. And C. Sticka continued to pay vendors without independent verification of the quantity and quality of fuel delivered. As a matter of fact, we only received four complete set of documents uh, that uh, when we requested all the material from C. Sticka. These problems must be resolved quickly because C. Sticka plans to begin transferring responsibility for the procurement, tracking, delivery, and accounting of fuel to the Afghan government beginning January 2013, less than four months from now. At that time, C. Sticka intends to begin paying for the Afghan Army's fuel through direct contributions to the Afghan government. In addition, C. Sticka has proposed to increase annual funding for Afghan fuel for fiscal years 2014 to 2018 by $212 million per year. We believe there is no basis for that increase. To address the serious problems we identified, we issued this interim audit report and made two recommendations to the Commanding General for C. Sticka. First, reduce the fiscal 2013 and planned 2014 budget requests for fuel to the fiscal 2012 amount of $306 million and maintain that level until a better process for determining requirements is developed. And secondly, develop, approve, and implement a comprehensive action plan to improve fuel accountability. I also took the following steps. I first, I alerted the senior leadership at DOD and the commanders in the field about the destruction of documents and emphasized the importance of maintaining all financial records which were required by law. Second, I referred this matter to my investigative directorate which is conducting an inquiry right now to determine who destroyed the documents and for what reason. Thirdly, I have just launched a new audit to assess C. Sticka's efforts to develop the ability of the Afghan National Police to procure, deliver, and account for fuel for its forces. Although C. Sticka agreed with our second recommendation that it needs to improve its process, it disagreed with our first recommendation and still intends to increase fuel funding for the Afghan Army and make direct contributions to the Afghan Ministry of Defense starting in January 2013. We continue to believe this is a mistake. It would be imprudent for C. Sticker to increase estimated fuel requirements and to proceed with writing a blank check to the Afghan government without first ensuring it is obtaining and using basic information such as actual fuel consumption and usage data. To do so would be doubling down on a very, very risky bet. In summary, no single commodity is as important to the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan as fuel, and no commodity is at such risk 
of being stolen or wasted as fuel. In Afghanistan, fuel is like gold. As the United States withdraws and transfers security responsibility to Afghan forces, U.S.-funded fuel will become even more vulnerable to waste, fraud, and abuse through corruption and theft. It is imperative that U.S. military and civilian authorities improve their efforts to protect the U.S. taxpayers' continuing investment and to ensure that the Afghan army is capable of assuming their responsibilities in the future. I want to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this hearing and giving us the opportunity to discuss these findings. We believe they warrant immediate attention. Thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, best estimate is that the documents were shredded sometime between October 2010 and March of 2011. Was that, do I have that right? Uh, what we know is uh, when we first found this out that uh, uh, a, a, a fuel ordering officer advised us that uh, some former fuel ordering officers had destroyed the records. Um, and the time period would be October 2006 to March 2011. The uh, commanding general of C. Sticka between November 2009 and November 2011 was, I believe, Lieutenant General Caldwell, correct? I believe you are correct, sir. This is a pattern of destruction of documents under his command that I find personally to be um, of deep concern. And it's something we should continue to look at. What there certainly had to be some sort of electronic records. I mean, we, this day and age, in the year in the two thousands, there had to be some sort of electronic record, was there not? Well, Mr. Chairman, we, uh, as I mentioned, uh, learned about this in April of two thousand and twelve, and I believe the auditors kept looking for these records. We assumed there had to be an electronic, uh, some records saved in electronic format. And it wasn't until, I believe, uh, July, late June or July, that finally C. Sticker told us that uh, if you haven't gotten it, you're not going to get it. We couldn't find any electronic records. Now, there may be electronic records of the actual payment. As we say, we know how much we paid. Uh, and, uh, but that doesn't tell us anything else. That just tells us how much we may have lost. How, um, tell me about this barment. I mean, certainly there are some bad actors in this uh, category of fuel consumption. Um, has anybody been disbarred? How, how is that process working? Uh, we have a very aggressive, uh, and I, without sounding like I'm tooting my horn, I think one of the more aggressive suspension and debarment programs, uh, and particularly in that field. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the area in Afghanistan, of course, is where we're looking. Uh, we have referred 242 companies and individuals for suspension and debarment. Uh, unfortunately, a number of the companies and individuals that uh, we have identified as uh, 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 subject to debarment and suspension uh, have not been suspended and debarred by the Army. Uh, they have, uh, despite the fact that we have provided thousands of pages of analysis, witness statements, and other documents, uh, as part of multiple debarment proceedings of fuel contractors, we are basically being forced to prove a negative. Uh, and by that I mean, Mr. Chairman, we have signed affidavits, we have statements from U.S. officers and employees who are saying that uh, the records with their signature on are false, that they did not sign those uh, 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 documents. But uh, the Army is saying, well, uh, unless you prove that the fuel didn't actually go to the military base for the Afghans, we're not going to suspend and debar. Any of these uh, uh, suspected terrorists or known terrorists? Well, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's a very good question. We have uh, identified uh, 42 companies and individuals who have been listed by the, either the Department of Commerce on their entities list, which is published in the Code of Federal Regulations, and at least eight of those who have been uh, publicly listed on, uh, pursuant to Section 841 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which deals with uh, uh, contracting with the enemy. 
Those individuals have been publicly identified. We brought their names and the names of those companies to the Army, and they haven't been debarred. We, we view this as just ridiculous. They should be debarred immediately. They are listed by the United States government as terrorists, but at the same time, uh, they are able to contract with the United States government right now in uh, Afghanistan. So of these hundreds of people and entities that you have identified as, as qualified for debarment, do you, do you have any idea what percentage have actually been accomplished? And why is the Army not doing this? What is their justification for that? Well, we're, uh, we, they just line us up in the queue with everybody else. Uh, in the queue now for the Army, it takes about a year. We, we used to have some intern sitting in some cubicle somewhere that doesn't have enough time to get this done, or what no. what's the problem? My, my, my concern, Mr. Chairman, is that they don't appreciate, I think, what you appreciate and what I do, that uh, time is of the essence. If we're going to make a difference and stop bad people from contracting with the U.S. government, from stopping terrorists from contracting with the U.S. government, now is the time not two years or three years from now. Uh, I have told my staff since I started, the next two years, if we are going to make a difference for the U.S. government, for the U.S. taxpayer, we have to redouble our efforts. Now, I am not absolutely certain that everyone has that message. It is uh, business as usual in a lot of government agencies. Now, I know there are people such as General Allen and I know General Longo and the people in Task Force uh, 2010 out there in the field who realize now is the time, time is of the essence. And I am not commenting on them, but I think there are too many people here in Washington who think this is business as usual. It is not business as usual. We are in a war, and if we are going to do something, we have got to do it now. Well, thank you. My time has expired. But given that we have been there for more than 